As Christians, we must get desperate in our prayers for God to reach the lost. Their predicament is worse than being in a lion's den. The Bible says death could seize them at any moment and drag them to an everlasting hell. If we're serious about reaching them, we must stop using unbiblical methods to do it because we're filling our churches with false converts. More than once when I've arrived in a city to preach, the pastor said, we're believing for plenty of decisions this weekend. My standard reply is, how many would you like? 10, 20, 30? If you just want decisions, and by that I mean people giving their hearts to Jesus but without genuine repentance, I can get them. But if you want to see people soundly saved, that's different. Salvation is of the Lord. But if we're quite happy to build up our church with decisions, the following are 10 tried and true points. Here's what to do to fill the church with false converts. Number one, don't mention anything about future punishment. Don't tell the sinner to flee from the wrath to come. One recent Valentine's Day, I got me a chocolate heart that said, be mine, right on, it said, be mine. And that's what Jesus is offering you today a box of chocolates that says, be mine. Number two, instead preach the love of God with a promise of peace, joy, love, and fulfillment. If you're not getting at least 15% back on your investment portfolio, then just try Jesus. Just try Jesus. He'll give you peace. He'll give you joy. He'll give you satisfaction. He will change your life. Number three, Appeal to the emotions rather than the will and the conscience. Come on now. Let's get excited for Jesus tonight. Number four, gloss over the serious nature of sin by emphasizing all have sinned. Spread it around so they don't feel any personal guilt. Look, we've all been naughty boys and girls. Heck, I've even been naughty here and there, just like you. We don't have to feel bad about it. Jesus loves us. It's okay. Feel good about yourself. That's what Jesus wants you to do. He loves you because he found something good in you to love. Feel good about yourself. Number five, neglect using the law of God to bring conviction. I have heard people talk about the Ten Commandments when preaching the gospel. What? Are you kidding me? Oh, that is nuts, people. The law was in the Old Testament, and we are of the New Testament. And we need to use the book of Revelation to preach the gospel. Because I'm preaching the gospel for today, not back in the day, but for today. Number six, for your invitation, use the old while every eye is closed and nobody's watching you, just slip up your hand method. Now I want everybody to close their eyes. I want everybody to bow their head and close their eyes. And if the Spirit has moved in your heart tonight to make a decision for Christ, I want you to go ahead and raise that hand. There's no peeking, come on now. There's no peeking, I see that. No peeking, don't be embarrassed now. I see that hand, sir. Number seven, have counselors gently pull hand raisers to the altar. Get him. He's raising his hand, right? Yep, in the black jacket. Saw that hand, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for your decision for Jesus Christ tonight. Jesus saw that hand. <laughs> he sure did. Thank you for your decision. Number eight. Sing Psalm 119 through three times as you make your final appeal. Let's sing that stanza one more time. <laughs> Because I don't think you're quite getting it. We're going to do it one more time. Let's sing it one more time, okay? And uh, here we go. No, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> Number nine, use light dimmers. Come here. You need to lower the lights now because I think they are in the mood to start you know, moving down here. Okay? Mo Thank you.
and number 10, build your church with a floor sloping towards the front. If you follow those instructions, you won't have to spend much time in prayer because these 10 points work. You won't even need God's help. What's more, the time you save in prayer can be devoted to all the counseling you'll have to do as you try to prop up all of your decisions who will more than likely prove to be false converts. Statistics show that when unbiblical methods are used to make decisions, they almost always fall away from the faith and become what are often called bitter backsliders. But those who do stay in the church will need a very souped up church with a cool pastor, a kicking band, and lots of activities, or they'll probably slip back into the world. In contrast, if we want to build the true church, we desperately need God's help. And if we want that, we've got to drop every man-made method and go back to the biblical model for the presentation of the gospel. out of your way to share your faith with strangers? Um, yes. Do you warn them about Judgment Day and do you mention hell? Um, no, I don't do that. Why not? Um, well, I just, um, I don't know why. I just don't, I don't discuss that stuff. What do you tell people then? I tell them that I believe in the Lord and, and ask for His forgiveness every day and, and He leads me on the straight path. So, uh, where do people go if they die without Jesus? Um, I believe that everyone will go to heaven, except for those who don't repent. So, where are those who don't repent? Where are they going? Uh, I, I couldn't answer that. I don't know. Do you think the Bible's right when it says they end up in hell? It might be. I don't, I'm not sure. Boy, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. That should be clear enough. You believe that? Um, anything can happen. I, I am not, I, I wouldn't know about that. Yeah. How often do you read your Bible? Um, not very often. Wow. When was the last time you read it? Uh, probably when, um, I was, uh, in high school about 25 years ago. Wow. <laughs> what are you doing at a Christian bookstore? Um, I just come in here with my wife. Yeah, well, I'm and, pleased you and came I, in. And I look for, you know, anything that's going to motivate me to, uh, further my beliefs. Oh, that's great. Um, really? You want to be motivated to be more of a committed Christian? Um, not really, no, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things in here, you know? Yeah. Anything that catches my eye, I'm, I'm willing to look for it. Um, do you consider yourself to be a good person? Yes, I am. Okay, let me ask you a few questions to see if it's true. This is what helped me more than anything else. How many lies do you think you've told in your life? Probably a lot. Well, I mean, real lies? No, not real lies. Well, how many real lies do you think you've told in your life? Ten, twenty, hundred? Um, maybe, maybe ten. Now, what do you call someone who tells lies? I call him a liar. Have you ever stolen something in your life? Uh, yes, I have. What do you call someone who steals things? Uh, a thief. Uh -huh. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Um, I probably have, yes. It's important to realize what you're doing. God gave you eyes to see with, ears to hear with. Uh, taste buds to enjoy good food. He lavished his goodness upon you, gave you life, and you've used his name as a cuss word, which is called blasphemy. It's very serious. Mm -hmm. One to go. Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman and lusted after her? Um, I probably have, yes. <laughs> You're a normal guy. Yeah. So listen to this. Is your name, what was your name again? David. David, David. Um, by your own admission, you're a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? Um, I think I would be innocent because I will ask for His forgiveness. I ask for His forgiveness every day. Do you realize that can't help you? I'll tell you why. That's like a criminal standing in front of a judge and say, Judge, I raped that woman. I know it was serious, but I ask you to forgive me. I'm sorry, and I won't do it again. The judge would probably say, of course you should be sorry, and of course you shouldn't do it again. You've done wrong. And he'll give them the law, he'll throw the book at him because he's, he's transgressed the law. And God's exactly the same. He won't forgive us just because we say, I'm sorry, or I won't do it again. Of course we should be sorry. We've done wrong, and of course we shouldn't do it again. So does it concern you that if you died today and God gave you justice, you'd be guilty and end up in hell? Um, I don't think I will. Like I say, I, I pray every night. I ask for forgiveness for the sins that I've committed during the day. 
you know, and uh, I believe he's a loving and, and fair God, and he will truly forgive my sins. Do you know what you've just done? No. Just broke the second of the Ten Commandments. You know what it says? What? Don't create a graven image. Don't make a God in your own image to suit yourself. I did it before I was a Christian. I made a God I felt comfortable with, but the God of the Bible isn't just loving and kind and, and merciful, but he's just and holy, and he says, I'll by, I'll by no means clear the guilty. See, David, what you need is a savior. You need someone who can step in and wash away your sins. Without Jesus Christ, God still sees your sins and his wrath still abides upon you, even if you're sorry and asking for forgiveness. And do you realize what happened 2,000 years ago? There was a legal transaction when Christ died on the cross. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. What happened is that God provided a savior and Jesus stepped in. You broke the law. He stepped in and paid your fine in his life's blood. That means because your case can be dismissed, God can commute your death sentence. All your sins and crimes against God can be canceled because of what Jesus did through his suffering, death, and resurrection. And what you've got to do in response to that is not just repent. What you've got to do is repent and trust the Savior. It's like someone saying, I, I believe in a parachute, I turn to the parachute, but if they never put the parachute on, it's not going to help them when they jump. And the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Dave, when you do that, God will remit your sins, all of them, forgive you, wash you clean, give you a new heart, new desires, you'll be born again, you'll come to know God instead of know about Him, and you'll pass from death into life. So, if you died in your sins and God gives you justice, where do you think you'd go? According to the Bible, not according to what you think or what I think, but according to the Bible. I don't know. Well, the Bible says all lions that are there part in the lake of fire, you're in great danger. So what you've got to do is repent and trust the Savior. And don't put it off. This is your eternal salvation. This is everlasting life. There's nothing more important than this, David. Make sense what I've said? Yes. And see, now there was a reason for me to come to the store, I believe. Yeah. You know, I normally, I, we normally don't come in here that often, but when we come in, you know, my wife looks for what she's interested in, and I just browse around the store, and I met you. Well, I haven't been in here you've for years. Me, see, you've enlightened me today. Thank you very much. Can we pray together when I turn the camera off? Sure. A great preacher of the past century said these regretful words as he laid on his deathbed. I have taken a long look into eternity. Oh, if I could come back and preach again, how different I would preach from what I preached before. Look what's happening here. Here's a great preacher lying on his deathbed thinking about what he had said to sinners and thinking of the enormity of eternity. Listen again to his sobering words. He said, I have taken a long look into eternity. Oh, if I could come back and preach again, how different I would have preached from what I preached before. Each of us needs to do that. We need to look into eternity and then ask ourselves, what are we offering this generation? Are we saying, hey, things go lots better with Christ? Or are we saying, Jesus will save you from the wrath of a holy God? Paris Reedhead had this to say about John Wesley's preaching. Wesley was a preacher of righteousness. He would exalt the holiness of God, the law of God, the justice of God, the wisdom of his requirements, and the justice of his wrath. Then he would turn to the sinners and tell them of the enormity of their crimes, their open rebellion, their treason, and their anarchy. The power of God would descend so mightily that it's reliably reported on one occasion when the people dispersed, there were 1,800 people lying on the ground, completely unconscious, because they had had a revelation of the holiness of God. And in the light of that, they had seen the enormity of their own sin.